right now. Uh, again, the title, Engaging Students in ME Using Everyday Engineering Examples in the Classroom. I'm delighted to begin by introducing Tom Perry, Director of Education and Professional Advancement for ASME, who enthusiastically agreed to co-sponsor Engaging Students in ME today. Tom, thanks so much, and I'm passing the mic to you for a bit. Oh, thank you, Susan. Just a, just a few short words for all. First, a congratulations to Ian and, and everyone in the Engage group for their achievement. This is the way we look at this is that this is at the intersection of, of two pretty important issues, and that is the uh, uh, one being the practical, infusing practical applications, relevancy, uh, and and uh, and uh, a grasp of reality into into mechanical engineering degree programs and NME and MET degree programs as well, um, at, in as early at as early a time as possible, freshman, sophomore, and so on. Uh, the other really has to do with method, and that's optimizing uh, teaching time. Uh, you know, we all know that there's that, that, that struggle on a faculty's, faculty's time and effort, uh, and, and how to uh, uh, achieve the relevancy goals while, while, while optimizing prep time and getting the best results out of students. The, um, uh, the need we see on the practical application uh, has, been, has been demonstrated dramatically in our um, uh, ASME Center for Education's research uh, under the Vision 2030 project, where we looked at uh, uh, the responses of, of a thousand industry uh, managers uh, speaking about entry-level mechanical engineers. Uh, uh, between six and seven hundred early career engineers themselves, uh, and the responses of department heads from uh, a good 84, 85 uh, universities. Uh, and the, the the snapshot of that um, is that the uh, practical experience on how things how devices are made and work that that relevancy piece uh, was viewed as as weak by uh, nearly 600 of those thousand engineering managers and weak as far as uh, and, and needs strengthening uh, as far as early career uh, engineers go entry level engineers even among the engineers themselves the young engineers. Uh, over 40 percent of them felt weak in, in going out into practice uh, in, in terms of relevancy and practical application. Yet at the same time, on the on the uh, uh, on the, on the academic side, on the department head side, uh, a good 42 percent thought the thought the curriculum, the ME curriculum, was sufficient in these regards. So there are some significant gaps here, and there are reasons for it that we need to try to tackle. The, the, the time gap, the optimizing teaching and so on, uh, is, uh, while infusing relevancy, is really what everyday engineering is about. Uh, and the, the fact that this work has been done, it's relevant, it's applied to the curriculum, uh, and uh, it's, it's being made available is, a, is, is an important achievement. Um, so, con so congratulations again, and uh, thank you for your work. And I'll uh, turn it back to Susan. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks, Tom. So as you know, researchers and educators have been studying student retention for decades. The reports and studies line bookshelves and take up space on computers. As you also know, there seems to be a disconnect between research and practice. That's where Engage comes into play. Engage is an extension service project funded by the National Science Foundation's GSE program, which is directed by Dr. Jolene Jesse. Extension service projects are a very exciting and rather unique NSF program because there is no research being conducted. Very unusual for NSF. Rather, the work is in the mechanisms and strategies that faculty and administrators use to put the research, in this case on retention, into practice. The goal of ENGAGE is to increase the capacity of engineering schools to retain undergraduate students by facilitating the implementation of research-based strategies to improve the educational experience. Our focus is on first and second year students because these students are most apt to switch out of engineering. We're currently working with teams from 10 engineering schools to implement three strategies that research indicates improve student retention at the undergraduate level. 
The engaged strategies are to improve and increase interaction between faculty and students, to use everyday examples in engineering to teach technical concepts, the today's webinar topic, and to improve students' spatial visualization skills. The other two strategies actually were topics of a recent webinar, and they are archived on the Engage website if you're interested in learning more about them. We've actually selected these strategies because they improve student interest and engagement in engineering. While they work for all students, they have a strong impact on women. These schools applied and were selected to be in the first cohort of engaged schools, and we've been working with teams of four, faculty and staff, from each of the schools for just over a year. Some of your schools may be among them. An additional 10 schools have joined the Engage project and will begin their affiliation in May, and an additional 10 will be added in 2012. Although we're formally working with a specific set of schools, all engineering schools have access to materials and support from engaged staff and consultants, so please contact us if you're interested uh, in affiliating informally or joining the project in the future. So at this point, I'm delighted to introduce you to Pat Campbell, today's moderator. Pat, the mic's to you. Thank you, Susan. And welcome, everyone. I'd just like to add my welcome. I'm here in Massachusetts where the snow has finally melted, so I'm delighted to be here with you today. Now, before we get started, let's do a little poll and find out a little about who is on the webinar today. As you can see from the poll, you've got uh, five different categories. So if you would please uh, click on the category that best reflects you and then press Submit, that would be wonderful. As you can see, you can be either a faculty member, a department chair, a dean, graduate student, or postdoc fellow, administrator, or other. Okay, so let's see who's on the call today. Um, interestingly, uh, the majority of you, 57%, are faculty members, which is great because you're the ones who are going to most directly be able to use the everyday examples. Uh, other is 29%, and I'm always curious about others, but we didn't have any open-ended responses. We're delighted, by the way, to have 7% uh, chairs and deans and 5% uh, administrators, um, and welcome to the 2% graduate students and postdoc fellows. We're glad you're here as well. So now that we know who's here, let me talk uh, a little bit about our featured presenter. That is Dr. Ian Patterson. Ian is the Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Holder and A.A. A. Griffith Chair of Structural Materials and Mechanics at the School of Engineering at the University of Liverpool. And now if that isn't enough, he also holds a joint appointment as a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Department of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science at Michigan State. His research interests are in experimental mechanics with applications in aerospace, biomechanics, and structural integrity. Ian's a fellow of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and of the Society for Experimental Mechanics. But for today, Ian's most important role is he's our guru of everyday examples of engineering. And that's what he's going to be talking about. Before he starts, I just wanted to let you know that everyday examples are not design challenges, and nor are they projects. Rather, they're objects that are familiar to students, like iPods, sausages, or even Winnie the Pooh. These examples can be used to better demonstrate and teach concepts related to engineering. But that's enough from me. Let's go over to Ian. Ian? Thank you, Pat. Welcome, everybody. I'm delighted that you've been able to join us. I'd like to start by providing you with an outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with an introduction. Uh, I'm going to uh, discuss some of the pedagogy behind uh, what uh, we're going to uh, be suggesting you can do in class. I'm also going to share with you uh, some of the 
results that we've had from a pilot study uh, in using everyday engineering examples in classes. And then I'll move on to the everyday engineering examples themselves, and in particular focus on what is everyday for our students. And then the final part, I'd like to look at how we can engage our students and uh, attract and hold their attention. So let me start with these pilot study uh, results. These are some uh, results taken from a um, study that we published a little while ago in the uh, ASEE proceedings in 2008. And we found that for concepts that were illustrated with what we called e cubed so this is everyday engineering examples, significantly more students rated their learning as high or significant than in the control class. We also found the e cubed overall value correlated very highly with contribution to the student's understanding. And a third conclusion we were able to draw was that the student learning was independent of the level of difficulty of our everyday engineering example. And this is a particularly important point that I'll be referring to a little later on. So I'd like to uh, find out a little bit more about uh, the folks who are listening in today and ask you uh, which of the following best describes you. Are you flexible and open-minded and happy to have a go at new things without preparation? Or are you cautious and careful? You like to investigate a new topic or process in depth before trying it? Or three, are you, uh, do you like realistic and, but flexible plans and you like to try things out by practicing to see if they work? Or four, you like to plan events the last detail and to know the right answers before trying something new. So could you answer our poll for us by selecting one of those uh, four choices? So are you flexible and open-minded, or careful and cautious, or realistic but flexible, or you like to plan in great detail? So please press one of the buttons now, and we'll have our poll answers up in a moment. So today, uh, about half of us on uh, the webinar are uh, like realistic but flexible uh, plans and uh, will try things out by practicing. About a third of us are uh, flexible and open-minded and happy to try new things. Um, we've got uh, a cautious 14% uh, uh, who like uh, to investigate before trying things. And then 2% uh, of us I like to plan in detail and know the answers before uh, trying. So that's an interesting uh, distribution, rather more of the realistic and flexible than uh, we sometimes uh, see. However, hang on to, to uh, which one you press, cause, and we'll come back in a moment and discuss a little bit more about that. So I'd like to talk for a moment about how people learn and share with you a model developed uh, uh, by Dr. Cobb. Um, published in a book in 1976, and he plotted two axes. On the first axis, he plotted in one direction doing, and in the other direction watching. And then on the Y, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot this bit. And he called this active experimentation, the doing, and watching reflective observation. And then on the Y axis, he plotted thinking downwards and feeling upwards, and he called these abstract conceptualization for thinking, and concrete experience for feeling. And he suggested that people fall into different quadrants around this graph. So over here, people who like to learn by doing and feeling, he called accommodators. In the second quadrant, people who like to learn by watching and feeling, he called divergers. And in the third quadrant, we have assimilators, who like to learn by watching and thinking. And then in the fourth quadrant here, we have convergers who like to learn by doing and thinking. So the phrases I gave you uh, to answer in the poll are, were associated with these different learning types. And so if you answered one, you're flexible and open-minded, then 
you probably like to learn by doing and feeling. You're probably an accommodator. If you answered uh, two, careful and cautious, then you probably tend to learn by watching and feeling, and you're a diverger. The 50% who answered three, realistic and uh, flexible plans, what they liked, tend to like to learn by watching and thinking. There are simulators. And then we had a small number of people who like to plan to the last detail. And there are convergers over in this quadrant who like to learn by doing and uh, thinking. So Adams and Felder have said that the educational role of faculty is not to impart knowledge, but to design learning environments that support knowledge acquisition. And I'd like to add a little clause for all students. And so that implies if people are, have different types of learning styles, we need to accommodate those learning styles when we're creating learning environments for them. OK, a few of you were probably muttering away whilst I was talking about uh, co-op uh, learning styles and saying, oh, but I'm I, not entirely in one category or the other. And that was recognized by uh, Honey and Mumford in the uh, early 90s. And they took the same axes. Uh, so we've got uh, doing and watching on the x-axis, thinking and feeling on the y-axis. Uh, and they suggested that people tend to cycle around the quadrants. And so we tend to start learning by having an experience. And they called that being an activist. And then we move into the second quadrant here, and we review the experience. And that, in that phase, we're being a reflector. And then after that, we tend to move to the third quadrant and conclude from the experience. And in that mode, we're tending to be a theorist. And then the final uh, part of the cycle, being a pragmatist and planning the next steps, and then setting off round again. So we may have a preference to be in one of these quadrants, but they suggested we tend to learn by cycling around them. The key word here is experience. It appears in uh, the terminology for three of the quadrants, and in a sense, this planning the next steps could be conceived as planning the next experience. Einstein said, knowledge is experience. Everything else is just information. And we're trying to impart knowledge to our students, not just give them information. Part of our problem at the moment is that students have limited experience in laboratory or industrial experience. And in many cases, both of these are declining uh, as we see cohorts of students arrive at our doors. Our task is to find their common experiences and use them to illustrate engineering principles. And I would like to suggest that everyday engineering examples provide a pool of those common experiences. And I think we can also use those common experiences to move around uh, this uh, cycle. So if we start at the first step in the learning cycle, and we use an everyday experience that the students have had already, we don't need a lab class in order for them to have had this experience. We can review the experience in class. Maybe we repeat it in front of them uh, to remind them about it. And this is an instructor-led activity. And then we can move into the third part of the cycle, drawing conclusions from the experience. And this can be a joint activity involving the instructor and the student, guided by the uh, instructor, but the student drawing the conclusions. And then, perhaps as part of homework, the students can be asked to plan the next step. So this now becomes a student-led activity. So the next time they have this everyday experience, they could look at it in a new light and set off around the learning cycle again, drawing new conclusions. Uh, from that experience. So let me find out a little bit more about uh, our audience today before I move on. Could I ask you uh, how old you are? Are you under 30, between 30 and 39, between 40 and 49, between 50 and 59, or over uh, 60? So if you could uh, 
click on the appropriate box and uh, press submit and uh, we'll have an answer up on screen uh, in a moment. So click your buttons now please. Okay, so we have a fairly typical profile there. Um, most of uh, our, our audience are like me, between uh, 50 and 59. Uh, we've got a few over 60s, uh, rather more between 40 and 49, and then falling off towards the 30s uh, and the under 30s. So, uh, knowing how old you are, let me just observe a few things about um, what it was like when uh, you were a student. Uh, so, when you were at high school, if you were under 30, the flash drive didn't exist. It was just being invented as you came to university. If you're between 30 and 39, then when you were at high school, not only did the flash drive not exist, but neither did the digital MP3 player. So uh, you couldn't walk around with things plugged in your ears very easily. If you're between 40 and 49, of course, you didn't have the flash drive or the digital MP3 player at high school, nor did you have the digital camera and the graphing calculator wasn't there to help you with your maths. And if you're between 50 and 59, of course, you didn't have any of these, but in addition, there was no internet to look things up on, there was no spreadsheet, and the solar-powered calculator hadn't been invented either. Uh, so things were looking pretty grim in the technology stakes. And if you're over 60, well, video cassette recorder uh, was invented in 1971, and the pocket calculator came along in 1970. So this development of technology has completely transformed the way uh, teenagers and uh, young people today uh, behave. To the extent that uh, there's a cultural gap between our students and us as professors. And it's large enough to have warranted an anthropological study. There's a book by uh, Rebecca Nathan called My Freshman Year, What a Professor Learned by Becoming a Student. She's not an engineer, uh, she's an anthropologist. She took a sabbatical year, went to a different university as an undergraduate freshman in order to study them as a, a species, if you like. And I, can, uh, I would recommend this to you as an illuminating read about what life is like today as a freshman. So now let me move on to everyday engineering examples, having made the point that there's a world of difference between our everyday life and that of our students, both when we were students and our life today. So an everyday engineering example is a familiar real life object or situation used to illustrate engineering principles. The level of idealization is minimized to retain relevance and context. And uh, if you think back to uh, my second slide about the pilot study, uh, I said we found that the level of difficulty didn't have any impact on student learning. And so it's not necessary for us to uh, idealize examples in order to allow them to understand it. Now, we can maintain quite a high level of realism in order to keep the relevance and the context presence in the example. However, the choice of example is critical there needs to be a transparent connection to the student's experience. And there also needs to be a basis for straightforward implementation of the engineering principle that you're trying to illustrate. So with that in mind, uh, we have tried to, to uh, specify a couple of essential attributes when choosing everyday engineering examples. And the first attribute is that examples need to be familiar to all students with the emphasis being on the all. So for example, using sailboats to teach vectors might work in Maine, but not in the Midwest. And walnuts falling from trees to illustrate kinematics of particles might work on a tree-lined rural campus, but is irrelevant for an urban inner city university. And in our books of examples that we produce, these were both originally in there and were edited out uh, because of their inappropriateness in some environments. And the reason for doing that is that students may panic about the context if it's not familiar to them, and then fail to listen to what you're saying to them about the engineering principles. 
Essential attribute number two is that we should pose questions with useful or interesting answers. The absence of a useful or interesting endpoint creates tedious intellectual exercises, and students can spot them from a mile away and are turned off very quickly. The perceived usefulness of learning influences students' motivation. So what we're looking for is what Art Heinrecher, Dean of Undergraduate Studies and Professor of Mathematical Sciences at WPI, has called fruitful applications. So let me uh, sh show you some examples. Now this first one is the Winnie the Pooh and Piglet example uh, that Pat mentioned uh, in her introduction. Uh, it's uh, aimed at freshman physics courses. Uh, the topic is buoyancy and it was contributed by uh, Chad Young of Nickel State University and you can find it on our, on our engageengineering.org uh, website. And he suggests that you start by showing them a Winnie the Pooh video. Uh, he's, the link to it is on the Engage website um, and discuss buoyancy and uh, you can imagine what's going on. Uh, Winnie the Pooh is drifting away on the end of a balloon uh, string here. You can ask students to calculate the number of helium balloons need to lift them in a lawn chair. And then when they have the answer, you can show them another video. And I have that video ready here uh, to show you. So this is a, an extract from uh, YouTube. Okay, second example. This is uh, on uh, food cartons and uh, boxes. It's aimed at freshman engineering uh, graphics courses. The topic is pattern development. And this one was contributed by Cheryl Sorby of Michigan Tech University. And again, you can find it on our website, engageengineering.org. And the suggested activity is that you distribute old cereal boxes uh, and the like uh, to students. And you have the students estimate the volume and the surface area of the boxes. And then ask them to disassemble the boxes and actually measure the area of card used. And you can have a discussion about the difference between their measurements and their estimates. And then ask them to discuss how the box manufacturers can minimize waste, for instance, by tessellating uh, the cutout uh, shapes. OK, I'd like to do uh, another poll now. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, uh, who do you think said this? It's very hard, so I try and make it as engaging as it can be. But you have to face the fact that no matter how good it is, you can only hold their attention for a little while. Was it one, Pat Campbell, our moderator today? Two, Eric Clapton? Three, Bill Clinton? Four, Richard Feynman? Or five, Charles Vest? Uh, past uh, president of uh, MIT. And while you're thinking about that, I'll just play you a little, uh, little clue. I'll click your button now. This is sort of applause that uh, the person who said this uh, tends to get. Okay, please submit your answers now. Okay, so 55% of you are Eric Clapton fans and got it right. Uh, this is attributed to him in the uh, San Diego Union uh, Tribune. He was actually talking about his kids and, and trying to, uh, to keep them uh, engaged. So it's relevant to what we're talking about today. And those of you who have young kids, I think, will uh, appreciate what he was uh, saying. 
So let me talk about Engage, the title of our project. Um, we're not quite at the stage of shouting through a megaphone attention to them, but what we're trying to do is attract and hold fast students' attention. That's the dictionary definition of uh, Engage. However, uh, our students tend to suffer a disease of the modern age, uh, which uh, has been called continuous partial attention. And so as a consequence, we have to use short pieces, and we may need to re-engage at each step in the course of a lesson. And I would like to suggest that our everyday engineering examples will help you engage our students. Let me show you some further uh, e-cubes that uh, may illustrate that for you. So here's a third one. This is about riding a skateboard into class. And since the majority of you are in the same age group as me, if you get on a skateboard and ride into class, I think you will have the students' attention. It is uh, for sophomore mechanics or solids classes. Uh, the topic is uh, bending moments and shear stress diagrams. And the suggestion is that uh, you ask students working in pairs to construct a shear force and bending moment diagram for you standing on the skateboard. And when they've uh, done that and you've discussed it with them, then show them how to find the shear forces and bending moments in a plank bridge as a skateboarder passes over. This is a rather harder uh, problem. And then to allow them to evaluate their own learning, ask them to find the shear forces and bending moment for a unicyclist passing over a plank bridge, which is a little easier uh, than this one here. This is an example from our Real Life Examples in Mechanics of Solids uh, booklet. Uh, if you uh, complete our uh, survey at the, uh, the end of the webinar, you'll uh, be able to choose one of these booklets and get it for free. Uh, if you'd like other ones of them, then uh, email us at uh, info at engageengineering.org. Our fourth example is um, cupcakes with a candle. This is uh, for sophomore thermodynamics. The topic is uh, reacting mixtures and combustion, and the suggested activity here is to take a cupcake, a candle, and a glass jar into class. Um, light the candle and invite sealed bids on the time to extinguish the candle when covered with the jar, with the prize being uh, the cupcake. And, uh, our uh, moderator likes to take a rather larger cake in than a cupcake to get a uh, more enthusiasm going with the students, but certainly uh, food is a good way to engage their in, uh, attention. And then you can invite a couple of students out to perform the experiment with the stopwatch and the, uh, and the glass. And then you have an opportunity to discuss combustion of paraffin and, the, and evaluate the energy emitted, because these little candles are uh, majority paraffin wax. And then you can invite students to calculate the quantity of natural gas required to cook a pan of pasta. This is an example that you'll find in our real life examples in thermodynamics. Um, available as before, and these booklets have the, all the necessary uh, equations and mathematics to support uh, these activities uh, in them. So you uh, don't need to uh, do a lot of preparation in order to make use of them. Our fifth example is on paper airplanes. This one's aimed at uh, junior dynamics uh, courses. The topic is kinematics of particles, and uh, the, the suggested activity here is to ask students to write on a sheet of paper three reasons why they chose to study engineering. And then exchange it with someone on the other side of the room. So throw it to someone on the other side. And you'll find that you get uh, balls of paper flying across, uh, aeroplanes, and maybe the odd sheet of paper. And so you have the opportunity to discuss that only the balls of paper can be considered as particles with mass, but neg negligible size and shape because with the aeroplanes and the sheet of paper, the shape has a significant effect on their motion. This example is part of a lesson plan that you'll find in our booklet, Real Life Examples in Dynamics, available from the same place as before. And our last example is uh, soap bubbles. This is uh, aimed at sophomore fluids classes. Uh, the topic is uh, the properties of fluids. And the suggested activity here is that you take uh, some straws and some detergent solution into class and uh, hand them around and allow students to blow bubbles. And then ask the students, perhaps working in groups or in pairs, to draw a free body diagram for a section of a spherical stationary bubble. 
And then uh, when you've shown them a uh, solution to that and discussed it with them, you have the opportunity to discuss that the surface of the fluid behaves like a tension membrane and explain that the detergent acts as a surfacant with local variations in concentration, allowing uh, changes in tension to accommodate uh, shape changes. And this is uh, an example that you'll find in our real life examples in fluid mechanics uh, booklet. So to go back to our pilot study, uh, we found that uh, significantly more students rated their learning as high or significant than in the control class when we used everyday engineering examples like the ones I've shown you. We also found the overall value of these examples correlated very highly with contribution to the student's understanding and that their learning was not tied to the level of difficulty in the example. But there was a final conclusion that I didn't share with you at the beginning and that was that teaching effectiveness was rated significantly higher compared to the control class when we used the everyday engineering examples. So not only will you benefit the students by introducing these into your uh, classes, but you'll be more highly rated and you'll get a, a hopefully more than a pat on the back from your uh, department chair. Now you don't just have to take my word from it, I've got uh, an endorsement here here uh, from Dr. Scott Kiefer, uh, who wasn't involved in our project, but has used our everyday engineering uh, examples. So I'd like to urge you to think big, start small, and act now. And so please ask any questions uh, that you may have. We'd be happy to try and answer them. Over to you, Pat. Well, I don't seem to have the rest of my team available at the moment. I'm just trying to... Uh... Sorry, that, this is Pat and I do apologize. This is what happens when you mute yourself and you start speaking to yourself instead of to the crowd. Um, I wanted to say thanks to all of those who voted to me, for me instead of Eric Clapton, and that I do try to be engaging as well. So I'd like to encourage you all to ask questions and we have one that's come in now. Uh, so Ian, how do I know if what I think is relevant and engaging for students actually is? Well, this is a very good question um, because uh, being uh, middle-aged professors, a lot of us are not very uh, good at identifying what's going to engage uh, our students. But many of us have got uh, uh, teenage kids or, or children in their early 20s, and so uh, we can try them out on them. Uh, it's one of the things that I do when I'm uh, writing these examples. And then, but the other thing we can do is try them out on small groups of students. Most of us have opportunities to speak to students either individually or in small groups about other things. And you can try out the latest uh, examples that you're writing or preparing on them and, and see what uh, sort of reaction you get from them. Another question that's come in, Ian, is can we use these examples in a large class? And if so, what modifications do we need to make? Um, yes, you can use them in large uh, classes. I've used them in, in classes of 100 or more um, because the idea is that the student doesn't necessarily have to have the experience 
in the class. What you're trying to do is remind them of an everyday experience that they've had already. Uh, so providing they can see what you're doing, uh, then uh, it's fine to do it in a, in a large uh, class. Um, and uh, with a large class, I might not divide them into pairs. I might divide them into slightly uh, larger groups so that there's uh, uh, less individual activities going on in the class when I ask them to try things out for themselves. But yes, they work in large classes too. Great. And now here's a question that comes in that, that I think is a problem that we all have, which is with my teaching and research load, I don't have time to revamp my curriculum. Can I still use everyday examples? And if so, how? Yes, we, we all uh, are faced with this one. And, and uh, that's one of the reasons why we've developed these booklets. Um, because you'll find in the booklets uh, lesson plans laid out in a, in a fairly simple uh, format and uh, with all the working necessary to allow you to use an everyday example and backup examples to allow you to explore uh, issues that are raised by uh, the initial engaging example. Uh, and these are designed so that you can pick them up and slot them into your uh, classes. So typically a book uh, will have uh, 12 lessons in. Uh, we've looked at the textbooks in each of the fields and we've tried to find the, uh, a common 12 uh, uh, chunks to divide the curriculum into and then provided uh, groups of examples uh, for each um, each chunk of the curriculum. So you can pick these up and, and use them and, and I would suggest you, know, you don't need to put them into every single uh, lesson um, but in order to get the sort of results we saw in our pilot study you would need to uh, use them for each of the major topics within a, a course. Great, that's very helpful. Um, and then here's another question that's come in, and, and this one is one that as an educator I worry a lot about as well. Um, the questioner says, I use and bring a lot of real life components to the machine design class, and the students seem to like and understand the concepts discussed in the class. But when you test them on the exam, their performance is, quote, back to normal, as in not so good. So Understanding is different than their ability to perform on exams if we test them using the conventional way. What do we do about that? Well, you construct exam questions that make reference to everyday examples um, rather than going back to the, um, well, I've, I've talked about uh, bouncing balls and springs that you find in the textbooks um, because it's, students will panic in, in uh, an exam uh, situation just the same as they would in a lecture when they're faced with uh, something with they're not familiar with and if they panic uh, in a lecture they don't listen to you and in an exam they freeze up and they can't uh, apply the principles that they've been learning so we need to extend the process into the examination um, procedure as well and Ian is that something that you've been doing with your classes as well uh, yes it is yes um, I, I, like most professors, inherited a pile of old exam papers from my predecessors, and I have to admit I use almost none of them. And uh, uh, I may take the uh, the idea, but then I, I wrap an everyday example around the uh, the question so that it's in a familiar context for the students. All right. Now, um, okay, this is the question that writers get all the time, so I'm I'm rather delighted that um, you're getting it as well. So, how do you find your inspiration for new examples? Um, okay, if you if you look at what's in our, our booklets, uh, they tend to come from three uh, sort of walks of life. One is in the home. Um, one is uh, student transportation, and, and the third area is is uh, sports and, and uh, leisure activities. Uh, so, this is not something I tend to write sitting in my office. Uh, I, I tend to prepare these uh, uh, sitting at home and I don't actually spend much time sitting down but I end up getting up and walking around and looking at things uh, and looking for inspiration in the objects that are around us all the time. And so how long then does it take you to develop each new activity for a full lesson plan? Um, a lesson plan uh, probably takes me about uh, half a day uh, to put the whole thing together um, and then 
at some time in the future I go back to it and rework it uh, and I probably spend another maybe quarter or half a day on it uh, and then I, we have a review group for the ones that are going into our booklets and so they go out to the review group and after they've um, uh, hacked at them and edited and made suggestions and so on I spend uh, perhaps another quarter to a half a day uh, revising the, the lesson plan. Within each lesson plan there are probably three or four real life examples so you can you can divide what my total came to there was probably about a day and a bit mm -hmm. uh, about a quarter for each uh, real life example. That's great. Um, another person has asked do you have any experience with students coming up with their own everyday examples and if so how does that work? Yes, I do, and, and uh, I mean Scott Kiefer raised that that they they all had um, broken bits um, of uh, skateboards and iPods and so on, and so that happens once you start introducing these examples into class, then students will either uh, will generally come up at the end of a class and talk to you about their own experiences. Occasionally, one will raise it uh, in class, and if that happens, you're very lucky because it, it allows you to uh, develop the idea using the student experience rather than talking about your own. But yes, the students will begin to engage with you at that uh, personal level much more than they would normally. That's, that's and, that's very, and that's very rewarding, of course, as a teacher. Mm -hmm. Now, many of the other questions that have come in um, really seem tied into what we were going to go into next, which is what everyday examples in engineering are available and how do you find them? Uh, certainly what this next screen shows is um, it's a screenshot of the website which is engageengineering.org and on this we have at this point over a hundred different example, examples and lesson plans set up. Uh, the website is bigger than this obviously the screenshot only covers some of the 18 areas in which we have activities so that I know that people were asking about um, if there were things that might be available for uh, electrical engineering and we are badly looking needing more for electrical engineering but however at this point we do have lesson plans available on uh, capacitors and on AC circuits. Um, other people um, have been asking about required courses that are not uh, engineering courses but are required for engineers and certainly at this point we have um, a number of uh, activities for physics. Physics is a very popular activity section so I think we have like 18 different lesson plans for physics and then we also have uh, some for we have three for chemistry as well. We are adding everyday examples every day um, and so that we would strongly urge you to come to the website to see what you what might be useful for you. Most of those are downloadable. Um, those that aren't that are part of Ian's real life examples uh, booklets that you will when you finish the survey at the end of this session you will get to pick the booklet of your choice and if you would like more than one let us know. What we would really like is to get some feedback from you about how you're using them and how they're working. So as I said, we have over a hundred, we're adding examples every day, but we need more. And so as you can see, we want you, we want everyday examples in engineering. So Ian, if you could move to the next slide, we can show you what we're particularly interested in. Uh, those of you who are asking about electrical engineering, we badly want you. Uh, we need more examples on circuits. Interestingly, we need some examples for introduction to engineering as well. Many of you use long projects that use everyday examples in engineering, but we're actually looking for more short-term things that can be used in one class or can be just used as a demonstration. We're also interested in examples dealing with calculus and differential equations. Uh, calculus, as you know, is a real gatekeeper in engineering and to try to make it more relevant um, and to engage students more in calculus would just be a wonderful thing. So if, if you're very good at lesson plans but you really 
need some of that inspiration that people were asking Ian about earlier. Let us know. Along with the lesson plans, we have lots of ideas about way, things that can be used to develop lesson plans. For example, you can use salt water taffy to demonstrate viscosity and stress, or the ever popular squirt gun to help explain plain colette flow. We have lots of those, and we're happy to brainstorm with you. Now, the good news is that the authors of every accepted E3 will receive a $150 thank you honoraria. You also, as the author, you keep the copyright on what you write, but what you do is you give us the permission to use the materials and to put them up on the website and share them with people. The other thing that you do, too, is you get a letter of undying gratitude from us explaining the process that goes to you and your department chair, and if you would like your dean, explaining what you've done, how it's been used, and how this peer review materials that you've developed are helping to make a difference. So if you would like to learn more, if you would like to become part of the process and develop your own everyday examples in engineering, and in engineering-related courses like chemistry, physics, and calculus and differential equations, talk to me. Send me an email. You can find me at Campbell at Campbell-Kibler.com. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. So let me close by just saying thank you. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of Engage for attending today. Um, I'm hoping that this is just going to be the beginning of our relationship together. That is, we're going to email the PowerPoint to you. Uh, we'll also email the link to the recorded webinar for you so that you can share that with your colleagues or you can listen to it again if you would like. If you've given us your address, your snail mail address, when you registered, that you'll be receiving a copy of one of Ian's real life example lesson plan books. What will happen is immediately after the webinar, there'll be a very, very short survey. When you click on the survey, we really would appreciate your feedback, and then you can also indicate which one of Ian's books you would like. If you would like more than one, drop us off an email at info at engageengineering.org. And if you haven't given us your address yet, then just go to info at engageengineering.org, give us your address, and we're going to be happy to send uh, at least one booklet to you. So please, take a moment to complete the survey. It's going to pop up right now. And thank you again for taking the time to attend, and have a good day.